a barista named Jimmy dropped 56 points in a playoff game last night. Run It Back starts now. Run it up, the run it back. Yeah. Run it up, the run it back. Run it up. Back. Yeah. Good Running Tuesday back. morning and Running welcome back. to the latest yeah. edition of Run It Back. Immediately, I must introduce my friends and my colleague, Sham Sharania, Stadium Insider, Chandler Parsons, coming to us live. The only one left on the West Coast, I think. And uh, Eddie G there on the end from the East Coast. I know you can tell because he's the most miserable with the uh, 7 a.m. start time. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Uh, guys, we are going to get to Jimmy Butler because it was a performance for the ages. But there was another game last night that was also including some performances that what is happening? Grizzlies, Lakers, overtime. The Lakers snatch this one, 117-111. They lead that series. Oof, that's dangerous. 3-1. LeBron, 22 points, 20 rebounds. First 2020 game in his career. That's that's actually odd to say at this point in the game. Bain finished with 36-7. and seven. He was listening. Morant, 19-4-7. But the whole focus right now, of course, has to be on LeBron James, the two old comments made by Dylan Brooks. Yeah, feels like he might not be, Chandler, too old at all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you gotta consider you gotta consider the source here. And and here's <laughs> where here's the problem with me is there's a line of trash talking and competitive spirit, and then just blatant, ignorant, disrespectful comment. And, and that's that's where Dylan Brooks took this. Um, and he's eating his words. LeBron is is too old, but he's not dominating this series. He's playing much better than Dylan Brooks is. He has the two seed on, on the ropes, down three and one. So this is where this is where it gets kind of dicey because this is where you become kind of disliked and not trusted and kind of a laughing stock because you can't say things like this and and then not back it up with with better performances. So it's it's tough and. LeBron, could he be a little bit more aggressive offensively in this series? For sure. And it seems like he's making a point to get guys like Beasley involved and get guys like Rui involved and he's playmaking. But when it comes down to it, at the end of regulation, he got to his right hand, he got to the hoop and he forced overtime. And then the same thing happened at the end of overtime. He's got the guy that's talking trash to him all series long and gets an <laughs> and one that basically puts the game on ice. So to me, it's... It, it's it's clicks it's entertaining it's it's great for us but this isn't trash talking this is this is immature this is disrespectful and it's stupid and <laughs> i'm not the biggest laker lebron fan but he's doing i think exactly what the world wants him to do after hearing what dylan brooks is saying so it's, it's kind of a joke to me uh, i'll hate a little bit because i'm about to stand out because I was amazed <laughs> last night. But, yo, it took 20 years for LeBron to do this? What a slacker. Right, like, crazy. how does it take 20 <laughs> years to get 20 rebounds? Uh, it misses the free throw on the big end one. Typical LeBron stuff. But I, I tweeted yesterday, you kind of just have to be in awe. I don't care who you root for. I don't care who you think is the GOAT. I don't care what your grudge is. This is year 20. This is a lot of people. This is the leading scorer of all time. Th these are historic moments. This is the stuff they put on the highlight reel. This is the stuff they talk about in 20 years like whether we can see it or not we're too in the forest to see the trees this is what they talk about they're gonna talk about when he went up 3-1 on the two seed with a game winner and, and, a, and another one to push it to overtime we're gonna talk about this forever i'm with chandler he's been wildly conservative and i'm just confused about it throughout the game and oddly more trusting of his teammates than I think he's ever been. And the teammates in question are Austin Reeves and Rui Hachimura <laughs> and, and Jared Vanderbilt. But it's worked. And whether he's pacing himself, whether he's still nursing the torn ligament in his foot, or he's just old and tired, whatever it is, he turned it on when it mattered most. He played 45 minutes last night. He, he shot the ball well. He, he, he picked his spots. And more than anything, he seems to be pacing himself. Maybe he's eyeballed this matchup and say, we have it, and I only need this much. I only need to push the throttle that much. But it's it's fun to watch. It's fun to see. They have a tall task for them if they win this series and whomever they get in the next series. But uh, like I said, you kind of have to just enjoy this. It's just history in the making. It's been incredible to watch. Yeah, I mean, LeBron James' performance was, was amazing. And honestly, he, he needed – his teammates a lot in the second half. When you think about Anthony Davis, struggled for most of the game, five points in overtime. D'Angelo Russell, Anthony Davis and, and D'Lo mm -hmm. both shot 11 of 28 from the field. 
Uh, they both struggled at different points, and that's why you saw Austin Reeves, 23 points, six assists, four rebounds, and, and, it's, and it's really remarkable. You watch some of these Lakers games, and they're, they run better offenses. They're more fluid when Austin Reeves has the ball in his hands. It makes you wonder, he, he spoke to me a few weeks ago talking about how he feels like when the ball's in his hands more, it, he feels more comfortable. How much longer can, you know, like how, how much do you go without Austin Reeves just being your full-time point guard? Again, with D'Angelo Russell there, he's gonna be your guy moving forward, but he hits a few threes in the fourth quarter. That was big, AD in, the, in, in overtime, but I mean, LeBron James, oldest player in NBA history to have 15, 15, and five assists in a playoff game at 38 years old. Uh, it was a remarkable shot that he made, and, and it was remarkable efforts that he got when it mattered most in the second half. Chandler, you, everyone's sort of touching on it, right? The, the role players who have stepped up, LeBron maybe not being as offensively uh, strong as perhaps people expect him to be, but they can rely on this, right? I mean, so far, this formula seems to be okay. Am I wrong? Yeah, I mean, he knows something clearly that we don't know. He's trusting his teammates. He's giving Austin Reeves the ball. He's making, uh, you know, D'Angelo Russell, without those three big threes, they don't even have this chance to put the ball in LeBron James's hand at the end of the game. And the, the fact that they win this game with Anthony Davis going 4 of 13 with 12 points and kind of on the floor every single possession thinking he's going to be hurt, is really impressive and LeBron again maybe he's saving himself maybe he's just kind of not wasting his energy on the offensive end as much being aggressive because he does look very very passive at times but that's always kind of been who he is right he's always been a playmaker he loves he gets off by making the extra pass and playing unselfish and he's just doing that way more now but he still has the capability to go and get you 30 to go and get you 40. clearly he's still physically got the strength to get to the hoop to play high minutes. So whatever he's doing, I'm trusting, because basically without their best player doing much last night and Anthony Davis, they still got the win and they still have the number two seed on the ropes down three and one. So it's hard to knock them when they're winning games. It's hard to knock them when they've had such a turnaround from this season from the trade deadline to now. And now you look in the, you know, looking ahead, they're going to get a, a, a wholesome matchup, whether it's going to be Golden State or Sacramento. That's better than Denver or Phoenix. So whoever they're going to face is in their favor because they're the two best teams in the West are the Nuggets and the Suns. And they do not have to see either of those to the Western Conference Finals if they get past, you know, those three or six seeds. Yeah, I think this this recipe, there is something to it. If, if he can hold off, it, it reminds me of, I hate to say it, 98 Jordan. Mike would score a little bit in the first quarter and he would pace himself. And they, if you go back and watch the 98 finals, they talk about it endlessly. Isaiah Thomas won't shut up about it. He's pacing himself. He's not playing defense. He's waiting until the end of the game. And that's where this recipe came from. And if LeBron can do that, and if he can trust Austin Reeves and D'Angelo Russell to hit some shots, and I know Rui Hatsumura, he finally didn't shoot well yesterday and finally had a sneaker, but he's been great for them throughout this series. They just need a few guys to pick up the slack. Now, like Chandler mentioned, one of those guys does need to be Anthony Anthony Davis, and he had a couple big shots late in that game as well. Uh, but they just need a couple guys to just carry them throughout throughout the game, and LeBron can sprinkle in some stuff here and there. And, but if he's healthy and he's ready at the end of the game, this is what you can get. And it's not going to work every time, but it's been tried and it's been proven, and it, it, it worked last night. And they have the Grizzlies on the ropes, and a lot of people thought the Grizzlies were going to take them out, and they have the Grizzlies on the rope, and the Grizzlies look frustrated. And that overtime, they look tight. They look nervous. Mm. Desmond Bain was passing up wide-open threes. He missed two wide-open corner threes. There was a lot going on, and uh, it looks like this series is over to me. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> it doesn't look uh, great. I, Chandler mentioned the fact that they could possibly get past the Grizzly, uh, the Warriors – or the Kings, should that be what happens here? But, I mean, Eddie, how far do you think this Lakers team can get? I, I think the matchup they'll see in the next series is tough for them. Um, th that is one thing I disagree with, Chan. Those two teams play so fast, and the Lakers like to be this prodding team on offense, and they like to sit down on defense, and they like to pound the paint. And so they want to play like an older style of ball, and those two teams are going to run, 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 and they're going to shoot often and early, and I think it's tough for them. Now, can they lock in? Can we get another level of LeBron? Can Anthony Davis dominate the paint against both of those teams? Absolutely. I think especially the Kings. We've seen the, the Kings get bullied in the paint for, for four games now, and it's only getting worse. Uh, I th obviously think they would prefer the Kings and their inexperience, and all. And obviously with, with De'Aaron Fox's hand broken now and everything going on over there. 
But come on, we all want to see the Warriors match it. We all want to see Steph and LeBron one last time. We, we, we need that. The NBA needs that. The script they got going on right now, it's, it's incredible. So if they get that series, it might be a short one, but it'll be a dramatic one. Thank you for referencing the uh, script because it does exist. Um, and clearly <laughs> we are seeing it happen right now. Look, I want to concentrate on the Grizzlies for a second because so much rightfully has been made about Dylan Brooks and how much he shot his mouth off. Uh, we all know about John Morant's season that he's had. Neither one of those guys want to talk to the media now. Um, Dylan Brooks just simply, I'm out. Do we have a problem with that, Chandler? Yeah, I think that's the most pathetic part of it all, honestly. To the good and the bad, you show up and you be professional, especially when you're this team and this dude, and you're talking like they do. You have to man up and you have to face the music. Whether you hit a game winner and you have 30, or you clamp LeBron after everything you said for the, with the game on the line, or if you have a stinker left, like last night and you play bad and you lose, it's part of your job and, and you have to, you have obligations that are uncomfortable sometimes, but it, this isn't right. And this isn't professional and this is things that you can't do, but this has been this team all year long. They've created this bad boy image, this, this, you know, tough trash talking team. But at the end of the day, you're still a professional. You're still an NBA player. You're still role models to kids that are watching you you have an obligation when you win you do media and you talk trash when you lose <laughs> you, you have to go and you have that responsibility as well to kind of explain yourself and 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 answer questions and it's going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be awkward and it's you're going to feel a little silly when you when you say the things you say and they don't go your way but it's it's part of the job it's part of being an nba player so you can't do this and then the playoffs too uh you, you got to at least give them some time and, and answer some questions. Yes. Okay. Yeah. John not speaking. I, I don't, I don't know what that's about. I, I don't know that I need to hear Josh say his hand hurts or he's upset about the loss. He clearly is. Uh, but Dylan Brooks, this is the bed you made. You know, I, I see people debating about his character and all this stuff all day long. He wanted this. He, he's showing up with no shirt on. He's showing up dressed like stone cold. He's, He's, he's telling us everybody stinks, who's actually an incredible basketball player. He's telling us <laughs> the GOAT is too old and he can't bother him and all this. St down 3-1. You got to answer for that. You had to answer for it face-to-face. -face. And if you watch that convo, Dylan Brooks didn't say much face-to-face. -face. And it's been that way. You know why I love Draymond Green? Because Draymond Green would be talking to the media right now. Draymond Green would be doing a podcast right now. Draymond Green would be explaining why he's an idiot. As a matter of fact, he did. He explained everything that happened to him with Domas Sabonis and told us all of it when he loses when he wins that's a villain like you just own it you keep going you you you, you man up and funny enough those guys had their own spat over the year and if dylan brooks gets traded away this summer which some people are guessing he might <laughs> draymond won the war he won the battle the war he won everything but yeah dylan you gotta face the music especially if you end up losing this series you can't skip media again like you gotta sit there and say hey either i stand by it or i messed up or whatever whatever you feel but to skip media three days in a row that's Ooh. a little embarrassing. I mean, look, I get, I hear it all the time about uh, Kevin's friend and all this stuff. Chandler hears about his contract all the time. And he, yo, just just joke back. Just laugh back. Just take the L and move on. Like, yeah, it was, I, I was actually surprised. And, and maybe he's not built for the persona he created. Well, you yeah, can also. That's the bummer. That's the bummer. Because I feel like night. I was supporting it. Yeah, you could just see last night, he's kind of backtracking a little bit, right? He's not talking yeah. as much. He's not playing as physical. He's not getting into it with fans. He did the interview saying that the media is making him this villain. So you can kind of tell he's eating his words a little bit, but we'll see how he acts in Memphis coming up. It's mm -hmm. such a bummer, dude, because I feel like if you're going to be a heel, you have to lean in. And now it just seems like we're setting up for some weak character turn that nobody wants, by the way. Uh, how many more wins left in this team, if any, Chandler? I could see them battling at home, right? Like, I think they are gritty. I think they're young. I think they're not just going to lay down for this team. And I think when you look at them, like, they've had a great season. They're they're a, they're a two seed for a reason. They need more games out of Desmond Bain like last night. They need John Morant healthy, but they do. They need, they need Jaron Jackson to be more aggressive offensively. They need Dylan Brooks to, to find a way to shoot 50% from the field and knock in some jumpers. They need Luke Kennard making threes. They need a lot of stuff from a lot of people. But I don't expect him just to lay down. I expect this game, this next game to be exciting. I expect it to be physical. <laughs> uh, 
I wouldn't be surprised if the Grizzlies did get one more and took it back to LA. But uh, when you look at it, the, the series has been dominated by the Lakers, but I, I'm ready for the next game. All right, Shams, the Grizzlies lose this series. What do they need to do? Well, I think we've been talking kind of about the Grizzlies' moves and projecting what they could do. They offered a handful of first-round picks to the Brooklyn Nets for Kevin Durant last summer. And I think when you look at what they've got now and who they've gone after, Mikhail Bridges is a name they went after during this season, last offseason, offering three, four first-round picks for Bridges. That's not a deal I think the Nets would do right now. But when you think about guys that you can go get, you know, a, a three, four in your lineup that you can bring in that can play both ends of the floor. I do think Memphis, uh, they want to they wanna build around this young group of guys that they have. John Morant, Jaron Jackson Jr. Clearly, these guys are your future. Desmond Bain. But can you add another piece with this group? Uh, how much more time do you give this current group as constructed to try to make these playoff runs year after year? But their position, they've got the flexibility. They've got the draft capital. They've got what it takes to be aggressive in the marketplace. We'll see if they want to be that way. What about... Yeah, it's easy for... Go ahead, It's sorry. easy to forget. They were winning that game late. I mean, it took some yeah. incredible heroics from LeBron to win that game. They were even... I think they even went up in overtime. They were pretty well in control of that game. I don't expect them to lay down, but if they lose this series, you know, Shams is right. They have to, they have to think about it this summer and... The type of wings that'll be available. I mean, a lot of people are monitoring the Clippers and wondering what happens there. I mean, mm. if Paul George on this team for the right price. That's interesting. I mean, you know, we don't know where it's going to go, but they were competitive last night. They've been competitive all series, and and Ja looks healthy enough. He's dunking on people. He's doing all kind of stuff. They're not going to lay down at home. They're 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 just not. But the Lakers know that if they wrap this up now, they 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 have an opportunity to sit back, rest, and get ready for the next round. So they're going to be ready too. Yeah, and let's not get it twisted. Their future is still very, very bright. Like they just touched on, they have an absolute star in John Morant. They have the the defensive player of the year in Jaron Jackson. I love Desmond Bain. So they have a lot of pieces. They have all their picks. They are just one piece away from, from actually being a contender and going to get a championship. So this series will leave them a, a sour taste in their mouth if they do lose 4-1 after having a great season being the 2C. But their future is still very, very bright. What if they get rid of Dylan Brooks and add Draymond Green? Should Draymond Green not sign in Golden State? <laughs> Wouldn't okay. that be fun? I found this on the web for this series. We'll leave them a sour taste in the mouth. If they do lose 41 after <sighs> having a great season, be a... Sorry about that. Okay. okay. First of all, first of all, I would listen to I that, would show, listen to that for show for an hour. For an that hour. was amazing. Hello, Siri. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> she liked my idea. Look, we've, we've gone 17 minutes and we have not spoken of the man who really just... He did some work last night. Jimmy freaking Butler, 56 points in a huge win for Miami. They were actually down 14 in the fourth quarter. They come back beating the Bucks by five. They have a 3-1 series lead in that one. Uh, Giannis did play, of course. He did finish with a triple-double. Brooke Lopez also strong. But it's all about Jimmy Butler in this one. And, and this is why people love him so much, Chandler. How impressed were you by this performance? It was unbelievable. And it was one of the greatest individual performances I've ever seen. And when I'm watching this game in the beginning, especially in the first quarter, this game could have got ugly really, really quick in the first quarter. And Jimmy single-handedly kept them in in the beginning all the way up until the end. The fact that he's tied the fourth best scoring performance ever in NBA playoff history Oof. is shocking. And it's not just how he did it. He was hitting crazy mid-range shots. He was getting to the free throw line. He was also defending and he was playing so hard. You could just physically see him exhausted. And he legitimately single-handedly won this game against arguably the best team in the playoffs all year long. So got to give him his flowers. It is, it's, it's crazy that we're just now talking about this because this should be the story. And everyone laughed when he said like, I don't try during the regular season playoff Jimmy. And now he's saying playoff Jimmy's not a thing. This was unbelievable, and it's hard for me to never not trust him again after what he did last night against that team who's a very, very good defensive team who has size, who has depth, who has quickness. They have a lot of pieces that can guard Jimmy Butler, and they absolutely could not guard him last night. So it was one of the greatest performances I've ever seen, and this is another story. The eighth seed has the one seed 
down three to one. Like who would have thought this, who would have thought this was happening? And then again, looking forward, then they get the Knicks or the Hawks too. So it's kind of lining up for them, just like it is for the Lakers. And it has everything to do with Jimmy Butler. Who'd have thunk it, Shams? It's one thing to say, oh, this was one of the best performances, but this actually was, right? <laughs> uh, no, no question. And when I watched Jimmy Butler last night, I think he wanted to prove that he was the best player on the court last night. He was hunting the best defenders. He wasn't scared of Drew, uh, Drew Holiday, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Chris Middleton, Brooke Lopez, whatever defender that they wanted to throw at him. He just was not scared. 56 points and the most impressive thing, on 19 of 28 shooting and here's the stat only lebron and michael jordan have averaged 35 5 and 5 on 50 percent shooting or more in the playoffs jimmy butler's doing it on almost 63 percent shooting he's doing it efficiently he's doing it on both ends he's exhausting himself and this is a guy in jimmy butler who didn't have another teammate score 20 points or more last night so he had to pick up a lot of the burden in order to will this team not only last night's win but this 3-1 series lead you have to give jimmy butler uh, a lot of the credit, Kyle Lowry came up big in, in some clutch moments last night. Bam Adebayo, uh, he, he did what he's always going to do, be reliable, be able to get on the court and play, be available, even though he was playing through a hamstring injury. So you have to give Jimmy Butler the credit. I think he was trying to go out there and prove a point. He proved that point. He was the best player on the court last night. Although Giannis did play, uh, he mo was moving a little gingerly on that back. And I think mobility and, and how he's going to move and range of motion is going to be, I think we have to continue to monitor with him. But shout out Jimmy Butler, for sure the best player last night. Yeah, Eddie, you want to say anything too or about uh, Jimmy Butler? <laughs> yeah, we, I got we, a we need to hear it. We need bowl. to hear it. It's got to be loud, Eddie. <laughs> Yeah, hey, I, I got a gigantic bowl of crow over here, whatever that is. I'm going to have to eat that. I, Reggie Miller said during the telecast, it's one of the great, it was the greatest heat performance of all time. And and I kind of laughed at that. Like, yo, I seen LeBron score 40 in the finals in game seven. What do we talk? But then I sat back and thought, like, it wasn't ridiculous. They're the fourth highest scoring playoff game of all time. This is not what you, the, what you expect from Jimmy Butler exactly. But he kept telling us, and he was right. And playoff Jimmy is a thing that exists. I don't care if he says it does it in the post game press conference or not that was absurd the types of shots he was making the timeliness of them he walks up and hits back-to-back -back threes just in a crowd <laughs> and it, the and one he had late like I, I i literally stood up and like yelped I, I couldn't believe the second three he hit in the fourth quarter i i I'm, I'm honestly speechless i have nothing to do but to tip my hat it's it's insane if he pulls this off He's a historic playoff performer. There's no way around it. Like, these are the things you think about when you wonder, like, yo, is Jimmy Butler a Hall of Famer? And you remember stuff like this. And I just want to say, Giannis, I understand his back is hurt. And I understand their defensive strategies for him to be off ball and help and crowd the lane and do all this stuff. But at some point, he has to pick up that matchup, right? Jimmy's doing a lot of this in ISO. He's not necessarily using screens to do all this stuff. And, and maybe he does if he's on Giannis. But at some point, I know the back is hurt, but Jimmy's over there. He... Like Chandler mentioned, I don't think I've seen an NBA player look that tired in some time, and he still kept at it. At some point, Giannis has to go, I have to shut this water off because we're going to lose. And I was shocked that they didn't, and he just let all those guys out there die slowly but surely. But I could not be more impressed. One of the greatest historic performances of all time in the playoffs. And, and you know, he might need another one to do it to finish this series. But if they do this, the matchup after this is looking way more favorable and if he takes this team to the Eastern Conference Finals, I mean, he got to start asking some questions after that. What? Like, how are we even here, Chandler? I mean, look, Giannis didn't want to talk either about it. I, I don't know if he's in more pain than perhaps he's letting on. Who knows? But as far as loss and, and how deflating this one is, ugh, down 3-1 after such a season. It's deflating just because how the game started, how they, they got a big lead and Jimmy Lloyd just brought them back and how they're up 14 or 15 points in the fourth quarter and allowed Jimmy to basically go on this heater without throwing a double team out and without Giannis kind of taking this, this defensive role and shutting off his water. So it's deflating from that point that they look back and they, they had this game and they literally lost on a great all time individual performance. But also you have some confidence too, that it took, you know, all 56 of his points to get this win and you got 14 points from both Drew Holiday and Chris Middleton that were wildly inefficient from the field. So I expect them to be better next game. I expect them to kind of clap back and, and bring it back to Miami and 
And then who knows, but it's hard to talk about anything other than how Jimmy just dominated. And you hear coaches all the time say play till exhaustion, right? Like that's like a a big saying in the NBA. You don't really see it very often. You could physically see Jimmy Butler played as, as hard as he possibly could on both ends of the ball. He would sub out of the game for about a minute at a time and he would just go check himself back in. He wanted to be on the floor. He knew he couldn't be stopped last night, and he literally beat this team by himself. So it's it's crazy to talk about that. I don't think the Bucks again, like the Grizzlies, I don't think they're just going to lay down. They're way too good of a team. The, the health of Giannis is very concerning, but go win this next game, and, and then it gets interesting. Uh, so we'll see what happens. But, man, this was an all-time great performance. Yeah, Shams, are, are we thinking – We'll see Giannis throughout the rest of the series, however long that is. I mean, he's back now. It would be tough for him to start sitting games, especially with the team on the brink of elimination. But I think when you watch him play, when you look at how he was moving, it's crazy. He'll still put up a triple-double and how much he'll impact the game, even though it, it, it clearly looks he's not 100% on that back. And I know the big thing around the Bucks was managing his mobility. Uh, his, his range of motion over the last week or so after that injury on April 16th when he landed hard on that back I think it created some spasms in that back and so anyone that's dealt with a back issue knows that it can come and go you can have good moments you can have tough moments and I think for for Giannis it's it's getting to the point where treatment on off days you're able to manage it and you're able to be on the mm. court because you can just see even when he's moving gingerly he has a big impact on the on the court uh, but taking it back to what Eddie said about Giannis and his defense it's it's interesting. This is like deja vu for me. I was in the bubble in 2020. I saw Jimmy Butler and the Miami Heat do basically the same thing to the Bucks in the second round against Milwaukee. And everyone was asking then as well. Jimmy Butler is dominating this, this on this court right now. He's averaging the most points. Why isn't Giannis guarding him one-on-one? I think that's just the defensive strategy that this Bucks team has, has, has gone with, right? Under Mike Boonholzer, it's Giannis playing this uh, free safety type of defense, right or wrong, but that's how they've, they've managed it. In 2020 when I saw it live and, and tonight, uh, last night as well. Some things never change. Right now, the Bucks are plus 128 to win the series. It's so daunting to say out loud, Eddie, that you have to win three straight. Can this Bucks team do that? They can, because at the end of the day, they are the better team. And I think the injuries that have piled up for the Heat, they, they're they crippling. And you need these type of performances to beat these team. The Bucks had this game in hand. They, they, they were pretty well, like strategically, everything. They, they were doing what they needed to do. Even with they clearly hampered Giannis, even with Chris Middleton, who was very so-so last night. And, and same thing for Drew Holiday, who was showing out. He, he's not like he had the greatest game. They had this game in hand. They had multiple opportunities to win it late. They needed a legitimately historic performance to lose it. And that's what happened. So you got to feel comfortable going home. The problem is, yes, you have to do this three straight times. And mm. as we know, a 3-1 comeback is historic, and it does not happen very often. And we're looking at two and, and maybe three series where we're like, hey, could they actually do this? Um, but if, if anybody's the favorite to do it, I would say that it's the Bucks because they are the best team in the league this year, and they do have home court advantage, and they do are they are the better team, and they are the healthier team, even with Giannis's issues. Um, so can they? Yes. Will they? Ooh. They got to win that game six in Miami. And, and and with the way it looked last night, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Daunting. Just such an uphill battle. Uh, taking a quick break here. Shams has been very, very busy. When we come back, we get the latest on Kawhi Leonard, DeJounte Murray, and De'Aaron Fox when running back returns. Running back, yeah. Run it all. Run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it all. Run it back. 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 Run it all. Welcome back to Run It Back. This uh, this first round of these NBA playoffs has had a lot of big name injuries. Um, one that I think bummed me out probably the most is the one we heard about yesterday, Shams. De'Aaron Fox, talk to me. So De'Aaron Fox has a fractured left index finger. That's his shooting hand. Shooting hand. It's the very tip of the finger, from what I'm told. That's where it's the most painful, the most unbearable, the most difficult. As you, you know, if you're De'Aaron Fox, you're gonna have to dribble the ball a lot, shoot the ball a lot, be in traffic a lot. So they will list him as doubtful to play on Wednesday in game five. I'm told he will try to play. I think that there's an expectation. We'll see today at practice how that that hand and that finger feels. Uh, But this is not, uh, you know, there's no, this team isn't strangers to playing through injury. DeMontis Sabonis is playing through a fracture in his wrist. 
um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in his thumb. So this is this is a team that's played through a lot this year. We'll see if De'Aaron Fox can make it back. Okay, Chandler. I mean, it's, he's obviously a vital part of this team. Can the Kings beat the Warriors without him? I'm, can they? Yes, but uh, I obviously now I, I like the Warriors, but this is tough. And I think with this injury, this is something he has to at least try, right? He's got to go out there. This isn't going to get much worse. If he has to have surgery after the season, so be it. If he plays in a game and you know takes a ball off it or jams it again, it, he's going to fix it. He's got six months or five months or so to, to rest and rehab anyway. So I think just the fact that he can still try and play will give this team a boost. And it's going to take a huge game from, you know, guys like Kevin Herter and Monk and Davion Mitchell. It's going to take a collective effort because this guy has been their best player all season long. He's been the most clutch player. So it definitely presents a huge challenge for them. But this is a type of injury where it's, it's not something torn in his knee. It's not something, it's not a, a you know, a foot or an ankle. This is going to be tough because it is a shooting hand. And every time he's dribbling the ball or passing or catching the ball, it could hurt. But I would love to see him at least try and then give and go give it a go and see if it happens to get worse or if it hurts too bad that he can't. But this is a situation for him to really show up, show his toughness, show his character and show who he is by at least just playing through this. Even if it's for five minutes, give this team a little to get out there and try and play tonight or tomorrow. Yeah, I'm with Chandler. Like, I think he's going to go out there. I think he's going to give it a shot. Uh, luckily for them, this is a medical staff has dealt with something similar. Not Obviously not the same fracture, but a shooting hand that you have to nurse and have to deal with. And like Chandler said, if it's a situation where it's not going to get worse, it's just going to hurt. You got to try it. Uh, people are bringing up Kobe doing the same thing and every fracture isn't the same, but they need him. And it's just shooting hand. And he's been shooting great. And, and it's going to, he's going to fill it all night and he's going to know it. And every time he falls and, gets swiped at or shoots the ball, he's going to know that that's there. Whatever that fracture is, even if it's this tiny, he's going to know it's there. But they need him, and this is the biggest game in the franchise in almost 20 years, and, and they need this game because if they lose this game and they go back to San Francisco down 3-2 with, with a chance for the champs to get him out of there, that after being up 2-0, that's not where you want to be. So they need him. They need him to step up. And I think he's going to, you know, knowing nothing, I think he's going to. And But more importantly, they need their role players to step up. They need something from Kevin Herter. They need a better game from Malik Monk. They they, they need more from Demonis Sabonis. They need, they just need to be better. Uh, they were a shot away from going up 3-1. And now they might be a fracture away from just losing this series, which is unfortunate. But I expect them to go out there and they need them. And this is cool, a cool game. Uh, this is an injury, too, where he can override the medical staff. This isn't career-threatening. This isn't season-ending for next year. You know what I mean? So this is something that he could say, absolutely not, like, I'm playing in this game. So I, I, look, to, I look forward to seeing him do that. I hope so. What uh, That series just took a weird turn. Another series that stopped being compelling um, is, of course, Clipper Suns and Kawhi Leonard. Shams, the latest yeah, Kawhi Leonard will be out for Game 5. Uh, this is going to be his third straight game missed tonight. And so Ty Lue spoke yesterday, which was interesting. He actually alluded to the fact that this isn't load management. This has to be a serious injury for Kawhi Leonard to be out. We don't know the extent of this knee injury, but for Kawhi Leonard to be out these playoff games, they, they've spoken about swelling, about some, some sort of pain in that knee. Is, is just not a good sign. It's unfortunate because this Clippers run, since Kawhi Leonard signed there, in 2019, uh, they've only had one healthy playoff run with both Kawhi and Paul George. That came in 2020 in the bubble. We know that that ended in a second round series loss against Denver right before the conference finals. So this is a team right now that it, it, it'll be curious to see how they handle the summer. Are they in the same position as the Pelicans with Zion kind of knowing and figuring out how do we get these two guys on the floor when it matters most? Because clearly there's some level of a problem here with, with them staying healthy when it matters most only one healthy playoff run together. It's just tough as a basketball fan, for sure. Yeah, that's that's tough as, as as anybody who even wants to watch fun basketball, Chandler. Look, the injuries do happen. Is this something more? But you never know, right? Because the, the injury history he's had, they could be just kind of not telling us everything. And, and it's a shame because Kawhi Leonard has looked back, right? He's looked better than he ever has going down the, the stretch of this season and into this playoffs. And that's always been the big question with this Clippers team is can they stay healthy 
And the answer has just simply been no this year. And you're going to see them lose to the Phoenix Suns. She's probably a better team anyways, even if they're loaded. But this is a whole different series of when you plug in a healthy Paul George, when you plug in a healthy Kawhi Leonard. But it's tough. This happens. It's part of the game. I understand it. This is this is a situation where it's not like Darren Fox's finger, right? That can't get worse. That's not going to hurt him from next year. He's younger than Kawhi Leonard. Kawhi Leonard's had knee issues before, so this is a little more fragile of a situation and fans just see that he's always hurt and they're going to call him sub. That's also not fair. This is part of the mm-hmm. games what happens, but we don't know the magnitude of the injury. So it's hard to you know, speculate, but this is just tough because this would have been probably the most competitive series. Two of the better teams in the first round happened to match up. Uh, and it hasn't been that exciting just due to injuries. So it's a tough break. You feel for Kawhi Leonard if it is something serious. Obviously, I also got a lot of personal stuff going on. Uh, but this is just a tough break for the Clippers and for him because this series could have been a lot of fun. I mean, look, the Clippers are probably front and center all season long when we talked about load management. It's a topic that actually makes people angry and they get heated. Um, but the argument for load management is you do it so that this time of year comes around and everybody is at peak performance, ready to go and healthy. Obviously, that's not where we are right now. And he's not the only superstar name that we've seen on the injury report in this very quick first round of the playoffs, Eddie. So season's going to come around next year and we're going to talk load management again. Does this put a dent in the argument that it works? I, I think it does. And I, it, that's the problem when they talk about uh, shortening the schedule or stretching the schedule out or getting rid of back-to-backs. And we've seen guys break their legs in half on the very first game of the season. We've seen this happen. We've seen guys fully healthy and just take a bad fall in the playoffs. Like, injuries happen. This is sports. This is, the, I think, the hardest it's ever been to play NBA basketball. You're asked to do more than you've ever been asked to do on offense and defense. Just the amount of cutting, just the amount of recovering, just the amount of changing directions, just the speed they're asking you to play at. It's never been this fast. It's never been this active. And so you have situations like this. And then you have guys like Kawhi who just have had debilitating injuries throughout their career. And and Chandler knows, and we've all turned our ankle. We've all had issues. Yes, your body recovers and your body gets back to quote unquote 100%. But that trauma is still there. That damage is still built up. Wh- whatever happened to you physiologically, it still, ha- it still matters. And to have this much damage to the same knee, it's frustrating. And, and so, yes, we could have sat Kawhi until March. And then this happened because he bumped knees with somebody or however this this issue happened. And we could have put Giannis in a bubble all the way until the first round of the of the playoffs. And he could have fell and hurt his back in the same way. And the same thing with John Morant and on and on and on. So, and, you know, injuries are unfortunate. They are a part of the game. I think the game is just played at a speed and a pace that's never been played at before. And these are the greatest athletes in the world. And e- even their bodies can't hold up to it. And so... You know, load management, I get the science of it, but then you watch this happen, and as a fan, you sit there and go, well, I mean, I guess he could have played that back-to-back way back when, right? So I'm with you, Michelle. Like, it does put a little dent in it. I just want these guys healthy, and I I don't know if there's a right answer to figuring it out. Just want to see these guys healthy. Want to see the playoffs play out uh, the right way. Same. I I know. It's Look, it's obviously a bigger deal to the guys who are suffering the injuries, but for the fans and everyone excited about these series, uh, it's – it's a cloud. Uh, Shams, we left the show yesterday wondering what was going to happen to DeJounte Murray for the little bit of a body check that he decided to run up on a ref with, and they've made their decision. Suspended one game. He will not play tonight in their potential season, uh, you know, ending game Ugh. in game five tonight in Boston. They're down 3-1 in this series. So the NBA ruled that he suspended one game because of, uh, you know, inappropriate contact, also uh, verbal abuse of the referee. We saw him clearly make contact, and any time you make any level of contact, Grant Williams got a one-game suspension for what looked like incidental contact, very light contact with the referee earlier this season. There's a precedent pretty much set there. So um, DeJounte Murray, it's unfortunate. I'm curious, Chandler, if you're in that locker room, how do you feel when one of your leaders, a guy like DeJounte Murray, when this happens, you chalk it up as a guy showing emotion, or or how do you feel when when one of your leaders uh, gets suspended in this moment? Well, you're pissed off because you're on the brink of elimination and and he's, you know, one of your top two players. And this is why you brought him for for a series like this for playoff to, to, uh, you know, survive in advance. And now he's not available to play. It goes with everything we've ever talked about 
with the Dylan Brooks, with the with the Draymond Green, you know, as feisty, as competitive as you want to be, there has to be a balance where you still keep your head and keep your sanity and don't put yourself in these situations to not be available for your team. And, and the NBA, they had to suspend him. I said this yesterday. This sets the tone that you can just go and you can touch a ref and you can threaten him or you can do whatever you want. You, you can't do this. The refs are human beings. They're going to make mistakes. It's the worst job in the world, right? It would, no matter what every time they blow that whistle, there's 15 people pissed and there's 15 people happy. And so you can't make every call correctly. That's why there's the replay. That's why there's views. And I agree as a player, I used to get so pissed off when they missed a call, especially in the playoffs or when the game mattered on the line. And you swear that that one player, that one call has everything to do with the outcome of the game. You have to be bigger in the moment and you have to be more mature than this. And, and now, they're going into Boston, you know, with or without Murray in this game. I don't think they really have a chance anyways, but now it's just a nail in the coffin and, and, you know, here comes summer and we'll see what they do with their plans for next year. But you can't do this anytime, especially, uh, you know, a game coming up with the magnitude that could possibly end their season. I mean, touching a ref, Trey Young gets all that heat, but that's just stupid. That is just stupid. Uh, we're not done yet. Up next, Shams. With more scoops, more scoops than Baskin Robbins. And that's right, I said that line out. Danny owes me five dollars. Would run it back, return. Run it all, run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it all, run it back, 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 run it all, and run it back. Oh, that's right, Shams ain't done yet. We've got more news. Coaching news. Finally, Rockets made a hire, Shams. Ime Udoka, the new head coach of the Houston Rockets. We know what happened with the Celtics. He was essentially terminated from his role due to an improper workplace relationship last, last season. Um, so he, he's done in Boston. He now goes to Houston. And the Rockets targeted Ime Udoka pretty early in this, in this coaching search process. They talked to Frank Vogel, talked to James Brag Brago, Sam Cassell, a few other assistants around the league as well. But they really targeted Ime Udoka as the guy that can come in change their culture, and when you look at this team, they've got flexibility. They've, they're going to have 60, 70 million in cap space. They, they could have a chance at Victor Wembanyama with the number one overall pick. They're going to get a high lottery pick regardless, you know, battling it out with your Spurs, Michelle. But this is a team in Houston mm -hmm. that feels like with Ime Udoka, they're going to be able to attract free agents, go out there, and, and be a team uh, that people will, will want to play for. And Ime does have a great, uh, you know, I think, reputation among players around the league. What an awkward conversation that must be. All right, Emei, we're going to do this, but you know the deal. You, you know the deal, Chandler. Uh, expectations for this young Rockets team under Udoka. I mean, look, he's the best coach available. I think his track record on, you know, as far as coaching goes, speaks for itself. And he's a likable guy in the locker room. Players play hard for him. Uh, it just shows you if you can actually be a good coach and you could win games, you know, we'll look the other way on the other stuff and desperate times call, uh, call for desperate measures. So it's interesting. I mean, I guess he paid the piper and sat almost a year and uh, now he's getting another opportunity, but you know, hopefully this works out for him and he's, and he's grown from his situation in Boston and he's got a lot of work to do here. They, they they're not very good. They, <laughs> They don't really have that many pieces that I like moving forward, but they do have youth. They have some talent. They're going to have a high pick. Uh, so we'll see what he can do can do with it. But this, this is going to be a process, and this is a job he's taking that's no, it's going to take some time. He's going to be there for a while, uh, but hopefully he gets the Rockets uh, back on their feet because it is a good organization. It's a great city, and we'll see what they can do this summer. Yeah, for all the talk about Steven Silas not being able to connect with the players Emil Doka is a player, is a coach that is going to do exactly that. He's going to connect with Jalen Green, with with Kevin Porter. He's he's going to lock in with those guys and and build camaraderie there. And that's exactly what they need as they look forward to what they're do, trying to do with this roster. And they're going to have a great pick. And there's always rumors about a former MVP uh, heading back home and, and playing back with them again. And and <laughs> so they do have a bright future. And I think they have the right coach now to do that. Um, but this isn't what he had in Boston. This isn't a ready-made contender. This isn't a couple of all-stars on the wings. This isn't this isn't perfect a situation. So he's going to have to show his coaching medal, and I, I think he will. I think Ime is on his redemption path, and uh, he's got a great opportunity to do that here now. I mean, it seems like a month ago, Shams, but we also learned over the weekend that Nick Nurse was out in uh, up in Toronto. What led to that? Well, it's something that we've talked about 
at different points this season. I think there's a lot of frustration within the roster, within management, and some of that critique and criticism went to Nick Nurse. And when you have a team with Pascal Siakam, OJ Anunoby, Fred Van Vliet, Chris Boucher, uh, Jakob Pertl, uh, Gary Trent Jr. coming off the bench, these are high-priced guys. And, and this team did not live up to the expectations. They did not even make the playoffs. They lost in the play-in tournament game as a favored 9-10 seed. So um, I think for, for Toronto, uh, Nick Nurse had been there 10 years, five as a head coach. He won a championship there. I think he accomplished a lot. He's one of the highest-paid coaches in the league at $8 million per year. And so they ate that money for next season. And right now he's going to be in the marketplace as a head coach, as one of the top guys on the market. We'll see if other jobs open up depending on how the playoffs go. But for Toronto, it was – they. What would basically Masai Ujiri spoke to the other day? They feel like they needed a new voice with this roster. Chandler, if you're Nick Nurse, what's a good destination? I mean, honestly, this is like Sean just said. This isn't necessarily Nick Nurse's fault, right? Like this mm -hmm. is just they, they just need to change it up. They need a they need a fresh face. This is the second time they've done it. This guy was a coach of the year as well as Dwayne Casey. So I don't know what ex expectations they. Maybe fire the GM, maybe look other ones in the coach, because this this is a very talented team and they did not exceed expectations at all. And you would, I would have thought this team would have made a little run in the playoffs. But Nick Nurse is a great dude. He's a great coach. I think he's now the best available coach that Yudoka has gone. And so I look for him to get hired as early as this summer because he's that good of a coach. He's that good of a dude. And it's just it didn't work out this year. And then. In Toronto, and again, this isn't. I don't think this solely falls on him. I think when you have a season like this, someone's got to be the fall guy, and unfortunately, it's usually the coach. Um, so, so we'll see where he ends up. But yeah, I, I think he's he's an ideal coach in today's game. He can relate with players. He's got great offensive system. He's tough. Um, so, I, I I still think his future is bright in the league. And he's got a sweet Nick Nurse logo, which I'm a big fan of. It looks cool. Shams Paul <laughs> Reed, update. Everyone loves a good B-Ball Paul update. So <laughs> here's what I've got for you, Michelle. Uh, B-Ball Paul and the Sixers, they've had some extension conversations over the course of the regular season. Um, there have been offers made from what I'm told, but there's no deal as of right now. It doesn't look like they're going to reach an agreement on a new extension. He's entering the last, he's in the last of his deal. He'll be entering free agency, restricted free agency this off season. And so when you look at what he's done in these playoffs, 7.3 points per game, seven rebounds per game, 58% shooting in only 16 minutes a game. That output that he puts in in such limited amount of time, it's clear he's going to be valued around the league. He's, he's helping himself with every game. So no extension for Paul Reed as of right now. He's going to go into the market, it looks like, as a restricted free agent. And some of the numbers that he's putting up, it's clear he's going to get some attraction in free agency. He's, he's going to be okay. Shams? power nap time we shall see you bright and early in the morning for us we will take a break and when i come back i'm going to tell you what it takes to be a winning parlay picker and i'm going to help eddie and chandler with the do's and don'ts of success when run it back returns Experience the NBA playoffs like never before with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Join FanDuel today and get $150 in bonus bets when you place your first $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. That means you can bet on the point spread, player props, or any of the other bets FanDuel has to choose from. You'll still get $150 in bonus bets. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Well, we, uh, we, uh, we're we finally back in the parlay game last night. Well, one of us was, guys. Uh, felt good to get the win. I'm not going to lie. It's like we're competing against each other now instead of the point of the whole parlay, which is to get all three right. <laughs> we are the worst. But we're going to do it again. Eddie, go. Yeah, we're definitely competing with each other. Uh, I'm going Marcus <laughs> Smart over on points. I just feel like the Celtics are going to have go crazy mm. at home and finish this series off. That feels good. Uh, Chandler. I I got John Collins. He he's oh. been pretty bad all season, uh, all series long. He he's got to give me at least twelve. It's, <laughs> yeah, that's how it works. I mean, uh, <laughs> got to give you twelve. I have Bulls plus nine and a half. I, I just I'd like to think this won't be a blowout, blowout like a complete and total joke. But what do I know? Uh, that's gonna do it for us. Enjoy the games tonight. We'll be back bright and early in the morning. Run it up. Run it back. Run it up. Running back, yeah.
run it up, run it back, yeah, yeah.